Hey folks, great to have you. Thanks for coming out and uh, tuning in and being a part of our Revelation study. Uh, we are jumping into the 14th chapter in this lesson, and man, things get interesting again. So uh, I'm ready to jump into it. Let's ask uh, for the blessing and the favor upon God uh, for the time that we're going to spend together here. So let's let's pray about that. Heavenly Father, I come before you right now, and I'm very, very humbled um, that I get an opportunity to try to make some sense out of words that were written a long, long time ago uh, for each one of us in all these generations of people following you. This is humbling to me, and uh, I just pray that you help me to do the best job that I can. I pray that there's favor um, in the sense that the words are clear and that your lesson that you're teaching us is, is one that applies to our life. And I just believe, Lord, that there's an anointing that you can put upon uh, teachers and students to be able to make the Word of God come alive and to do its work in each one of our lives. And I am humbly asking for that right now, that you would do that. Um, in your, your majestic way. I thank you for this beautiful, beautiful book. And I look forward to the day someday in heaven when we will finally understand all of it without any doubt whatsoever. And right now we just kind of muddle through it and get the best we can. And my prayer is that you will anoint uh, this time right here as we look at this chapter that we begin to make sense of it. So thank you, Lord, for this privilege. Thank you so much for the people who are watching this lesson. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, uh, let's jump into this thing. Revelation 14 is kind of a transition chapter, and here's what I mean by that, is that the 14th chapter is going to insert a, a dose of hope and motivation. It's going to be kind of a build-up chapter, and what makes that somewhat transitory is that for the last two chapters, the previous chapters, have been somewhat some fear and trepidation. So it's almost, okay, we, we've been camped out in anxious fear over what we've been learning, and we are now going to be escalated into a sense of of hope, of motivation, and encouragement. And that's what happens in chapter 14. That's the uniqueness of this chapter. Um, we've just kind of come out of those two previous chapters, 12 and 13, and we were introduced to three awful characters. One of those characters uh, was the dragon, ultimately was Satan. And uh, we read about Satan's strategy in trying to attack the force of good. And you'll remember if you've been with us for a couple of lessons that he first of all went after Jesus and God said, no, you're not going to attack Jesus. You're not going to defeat him. And so because the dragon lost the battle to win Jesus, then the dragon begins to attack the woman, which ultimately is the church, uh, the, the manifestation of God's power on this earth to deliver Jesus to the world. And so he went after the woman, he went after the church, God wraps his arm around the church and uh, says, no, you're not going to defeat the church. And so since Satan was unsuccessful with Jesus and unsuccessful with the church, we find the 12th chapter ending by him saying that the dragon now will go after the offspring of the woman, which are the individual saints, the believers in Jesus throughout history, myself and probably you. And so we're, we're kind of in that midst of the 12th chapter where we end with this somewhat fear and trepidation, and then the 13th chapter only throws icing on that cake by talking about the remaining two awful characters, the two beasts. And the beast are the strategies of the dragon to come after the individual saints. And so we read about the beast, and we had a couple lessons on those. The beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth. And we interpreted both of those as the beast out of the sea being an anti-God empire, an anti-God government. 
that God will, or that Satan will use to attack those who are good. And then the beast out of the earth is the representation of that government, representation of an empire, more than likely the Antichrist. And one of the things that we said during those two um, run throughs with those beasts, I wanted you to remember that, is the timeless nature of this. That there will always be anti God governments. There will always be anti God empires in the world. And there will always be evil characters attached to them that will be used ultimately by the dragon Satan to come after the people of God. And so we have times in history where we can identify that we think that was one of the beasts, okay? Uh, the Old Testament Jews would have certainly called out Babylon as one of those anti God governments governments, King Nebuchadnezzar, that, that, that representation of government. In the first century, you can bet the farm that when the first readers were reading this, they were thinking of Rome and perhaps the emperor Nero. And throughout history, you and I probably can read that. And many of us might remember the days of Hitler uh, representing Nazi Germany. And so the point is that the strategies of the devil, the dragon, are timeless. They are always repeating themselves. There will be more and more beasts out of the sea, more and more beasts out of the earth, until the beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth appear. And so that's what you and I have been dealing with for a number of lessons as we've went through chapter 12 and 13, and the end result of that is a bit of fear and trepidation, okay? This is scary stuff. We are facing demonic powers as we try to live for Jesus, even in this day and age. And so with all of that in the background, the 14th chapter arises. And the 14th chapter provides a dose of hope. And, and again, I, I kind of sense that as I've been going through this study that after the 12th and 13th chapter, you almost feel a little bit beat down and scared if you're on the side of God, the side of good, because you realize the power that the enemy has upon us. And so John says, maybe it's time to build up, encourage, motivate, give kind of a dose of hope. And so that comes out in chapter 14. Now, if you have your Bible, I want you to see something that I think is really important. I want you to take note of something. I'm going to show you three verses in chapter 14, and then you're going to see why I'm showing these verses. I'd like you to start with verse 1. So chapter 14, verse 1, and here's how it starts. Then I looked. That's all I want you to see in verse 1. Then I looked. Now, I want you to advance then to the sixth verse, chapter 14, verse 6, and here's how the sixth verse starts. Then I saw. So verse 1, then I looked, verse 6, then I saw. Now, I'd like you to advance all the way to the 14th verse, and it starts like this way. I looked. So verse 1 then I looked, verse 6, I saw, and verse 14, I looked. All three of those, looked and saw and looked, are the same Greek word. They are past tense of the word hara'o, which means to see. And so what John does in the 14th chapter is he tells us that he saw three things, and he broke that chapter that way. Now, there are so much... Uh, there's so much information in these three images that it, it, it just doesn't do its service to look at all three of them in one lesson. And so I want to break them down. I want to I want to spend one lesson per each vision, each image, each thing that John saw. And the first thing that he saw is represented in the first five verses. So I want to read Revelation 14 verses 1 through 5. And then we're going to dive into it and break it down a little bit. So, verse 1. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. 
And I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. And the sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Now, let's take those five verses and let's get down into the weeds. And we're going to look at some very specific things. And you're going to find out at the end of the day that this is an encouraging, upbuilding word because we've really been through some stuff the last two chapters. All right, we, we start out by John telling us that he sees the lamb standing on Mount Zion. Now, we already know who the lamb is. Um, that is a description of Jesus. And all the way back in chapter 5, when John was allowed to look into heaven and tell us what Jesus looks like in heaven, he used the metaphor, the analogy of a lamb repetitively in the fifth chapter. And so when we arrive at the 14th chapter and he says, I looked into heaven and I saw a lamb. We already know who he's talking about. He says, I saw Jesus. And Jesus is at Mount Zion. He is on Mount Zion. Now, every Jew in the first century knew exactly what we were talking about. Mount Zion is an actual location in the city of Jerusalem. It happens to be the highest point in the city. You could go there today. The highest elevated point in the city of Jerusalem was known as Mount Zion. And, and it came to be known, it came to be understood as, as somewhat the dwelling place of God. So the city of Jerusalem is the city of God, and the highest point in the city, they came to understand it as that's where the presence of God is. It is the dwelling of God. If you take notes, I want you to write this down. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. I'll read it. You can look at it later, but it talks about how they viewed uh, the, the, uh, the idea of Mount Zion. Verse 22 in Hebrews 12 says, but you have come to Mount Zion, watch this, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. And so they viewed Mount Zion as the dwelling place of God. Now, this is another place in the book, kind of a side note here, where I, 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 just, I just love how John does this because what he could have written, what he could have said is, I see Jesus in heaven. That's what he could have said, but he didn't do that. He had this beautiful prose that he wrote with the book of Revelation. And instead of saying, hey, I saw Jesus in heaven, he said, I saw the lamb on Mount Zion. It was a metaphor of that, just a beautiful way uh, to write it. Now, John tells us that the lamb on Mount Zion, Jesus in heaven, is very important. He tells us that Jesus is doing something. And it is very easy to miss this. Read it and just cruise right on by. In fact, when I, I read it, I'll bet everybody just cruised right on by, didn't think a thing of it. But it says one thing that Jesus is doing, he is standing. Now that seems really unimpressive, doesn't it? He just, he's just standing. But I want to share an idea with you about this concept of Jesus standing in heaven that, that I think this might be talking about. I don't know. It's at least worthy of our consideration. Most of the time when you're reading the Bible and you find places where it talks about Jesus in heaven, most of the time it says this, that he is seated in heaven. He's sitting next to his father in heaven at the right hand of God. He is sitting in heaven. Most times you read the Bible about Jesus in heaven, that's what you find out. Colossians 3, 1, just an example. Write that down. Chapter 3, verse 1, book of Colossians. It says, since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. 
And so that's kind of what we think of when we think of Jesus in heaven sitting down. And the reason that I mention this, that I think it's worthy of us at least thinking through this a little bit, is that there's a couple places in the Bible where Jesus is said to be standing, not seated in his normal position, but he is standing. Now, now one of those, with is just kind of a, an interesting place to look at, is in the book of Acts chapter 7. I just want to tell you that story. Some of you might be familiar with what happens in Acts 7. The church is pretty new in Jerusalem, and they, uh, they built together a team of, of, of men who were going to oversee one of the most largest, biggest things they did at a church, and that was the daily feeding of all the widows, um, hundreds and hundreds of widows, and they just took care of them. They made sure they had some food. Massive job. And so they, they raised up seven men who'd kind of organize that and, and kind of oversee all that and help everybody who's involved in that ministry. And one of those seven was a guy named Stephen. And Stephen was kind of an unusual guy, man. He was, he, he was just really, really at a level of spiritual maturity that not everybody rises to. We're told he was filled with the Holy Spirit. We're told that he preached. And so he was just kind of one of these cream of the crop followers of God in Acts chapter 7. Now, in that chapter, we have a sermon that Stephen preached to the religious leaders of the day. And I want you to know, as I say here at Eastside, he got up under their grill, man, and he called them out for killing Jesus. And they kind of mis mistook who Jesus was. And 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 Peter or, or uh, Stephen came out and said, "You guys are the one that killed him." And that riled these guys up, and they were they were they had their hackles up, and they wanted to attack Stephen, and they wanted to kill Stephen because of what he preached. Now, I preached some pretty tough stuff before in my life. I've never had people rise up and want to kill me, and they wanted to kill him. And so when all that was really getting intense in the seventh chapter, the Bible says in the seventh chapter, verse 56, Stephen looks up into heaven while all these people are just losing their minds over him, and he said this. He said, I see heaven open, and the Son of Man, Jesus, standing at the right hand of God. What do you mean standing? Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. And Stephen looks up and says, now he's standing. And it's one of the very unusual times in the Bible where we find Jesus rising to his feet. And so you think, okay, what in the world does that mean? Why is it even relevant? Is, is it something we ought to think through? And I want you to think about something. Stephen is going to be stoned to death momentarily for these people. That's what happened in chapter 7. They kill Stephen. And before that happens, right before that happens, God allows Stephen to look up into the tribunal of heaven, the very place that Stephen is going to be momentarily to receive his sentence for his, return, for his eternity. Everybody must give an account before the Father. Upon our death, everybody gives an account. And Stephen is allowed by God to look up into the courtroom scene of heaven where he is going to appear. And he said, I see the Son of Man. I see Jesus standing. Now, what's the big deal about that? I don't know. I mean, think of a modern-day courtroom, okay? Think of a modern-day courtroom where where the trial is done, the verdict of guilty has been laid out, and now the judge is going to read the sentence. Think of what the tribunal courtrooms of this earth are like. Think about that scene. And so the judge behind his desk has the sentence in his hand. He tells the defendant to rise. Now, who else stands with the defendant? Who else stands? His attorney, his defense attorney. And he rises up, and then the judge cast out the sentence to the defendant. Now, now let, let's say this, that what Stephen is looking at is the judge, Jesus. If you could envision that scene when you appear before the Father God, 
and the judge, we're told that Jesus will judge the living and the dead. The judge, right before his sentence is given to you, rises up from his, his seat, walks around the judge's desk, comes over and stands next to you as your defense attorney. What criminal... What guilty person wouldn't give everything in the world for the judge to double as your defense attorney? And I think just maybe what's happening in Acts 7 is that Stephen looks up into the tribunal of God and finds out what it will be like for the people of God to face their judgment. And the judge stands up with you to defend you, to welcome you, to embrace you. The judge, the son of man, the lamb of God, wraps his arms around you and says, you belong to me. That's an incredible view of why Jesus is seen in heaven as standing. Now that happens in Acts chapter 7. Very unusual because most time Jesus is seated, and the next time we see it is in Revelation chapter 14. What's happening in Revelation chapter 14 is we've just had the onslaught of these beasts. We've had the, the very worst of Satan shown to us and his attack upon the people of God. And chapter 14 comes on and John says, you needed to lift it up. You needed an encouragement. You need a dose of motivation. And I want you to know that the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God will stand for you. That the Lamb of God will be on your side. The Lamb of God will welcome you, the judge, the eternal judge, is your defense attorney. Incredible image about Jesus standing. Now, John says that he's standing with 144,000 people. Now, who in the world are those people? Well, you can imagine there are all sorts of possible interpretations to, <coughs> excuse me, that number of 144,000. Some people groups, some religious groups believe there's going to be exactly 144,000 people in heaven. I find it interesting that those groups believe that they are among that number, okay? I just find that always fascinating to me. Other people believe that Jesus is going to have a rapture of his church, and so let's say the rapture happened right now, and all Christian people are just taken up into heaven, and then we enter a period of great turmoil called the Great Tribulation and the appearance of the Antichrist, and I mean, it's just terrible on earth. All the Christians are gone, and Satan is just doing his mess magic, terrible, terrible stuff on this earth. And then at the end of that, Jesus returns for the second time. And, and some people believe that during that terrible great tribulation, there will be 144,000 people become Christians. So there's all kinds of views about it, okay? I think since we have taken a symbolic approach to the book to this point, that we ought to keep a symbolic approach to this number. So one of the one of the the uh, the interpretations of that number goes back to chapter seven of the book of Revelation, and at that point we were told about the power of of uh, Satan on this earth and all the horrible things that he's going to be able to do, and we're told in the seventh chapter that God will protect a group of people during that time from the onslaught of Satan, and there will be a hundred and forty four thousand of those people protected. So we've already seen this number in the book, and we interpreted it back then as a symbolic image. So think about 144,000. We have the 12 tribes of the Old Testament, and we have the 12 apostles of the New Testament. So we have the Old Covenant with God, the New Covenant with God, 12 and 12. What do you get when you multiply 12 and 12? 144. And there's many, many, many people in heaven. So you just put a thousand on it. 144,000 is a number that represents all of the redeemed of God in all of history. 
from the old covenant to the new covenant. It represents everybody who gets to heaven and spends heaven eternally with God. And what we find out in this dose of encouragement in chapter 14, in the midst of evil having its way, evil battling on this earth, we find out that Jesus will stand and he will absolutely embrace those who have been faithful on this earth. Evil will not defeat the people of God. Evil will not defeat them, that we will be welcomed by a Savior who will stand for us and be next to us. The dragon and his beast will not win this war. We will be embraced by the Lamb in heaven. That's the dose of encouragement. That's what the dose is. Now, I want to stop there and take a pause. I want to make a very important point, and I don't know really that we Christians in America sometimes understand this point. So I want to, I want to spend a minute and talk about that. I hear us talking often, and I do too, about how Christians on this earth, particularly in our country, we, we want God to bless us, and, and we want to get the most out of life. We want to be happy. We want to be prosperous. We have great relationships. We, we just want the whole ball of wax, and we often pray for that, that, God, you will give us that on this earth. I mean, you think about that. You probably have prayed, if you're praying person last week, you prayed about something on this earth in your life that God would put his hand of blessing on it, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing inherently wrong with that at all. The Bible gives us a lot of examples where God God just puts a favor on people on this earth. I mean, think of Job. I mean, Job had it all, and Satan took it away, and Job was faithful, and so and so God gave it all back to him doubled. So God is involved in blessing our lives on this earth. But here's what I want you to see, and we see it in the 14th chapter. The ultimate goal of God is not for you to have a great life on this earth. That's not his ultimate goal for you. You might get that, but you might not get that either. But this idea that, that life is just going to be smooth, man, and it's going to be blessed, and I'm not going to have any, any problems at all, we want to pray for that. That's not how God comes in and rescues. That's not. The ultimate goal of God, the dose of hope, the dose of motivation, doesn't have anything to do with earth being a great blessing to us. It has to do with us being welcomed in heaven. So you think about all the things that we might want on this earth and, and Satan maybe has messed up some relationships. And so we want those relationships restored. We want the marriage to be healthy. We want the friends to come back together. We want to be restored with our, our teenage children. We, got, we, we, we see what Satan is and we just say, God, would you put a favor on that? None of that's here in chapter 14. It's not there. You might have times in your life where you've been physically ill and you, you want a disease to disappear or you want a surgery to go successful. And, and we just pray, God, put health on me. We want to be healthy on this earth. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there is nothing in this passage about that. Nothing. We, we, we want, we want a, a favor on our finances. We want to overcome mental illnesses and struggles that we're dealing with. And nothing of the earth is there at all. John comes out and says that the number one goal of God in your life is to rescue you from the demonic powers of the dragon and his beast that are wreaking havoc in your life. And God wants you to go to heaven where none of that will have a power over you. Let's remember that the ultimate goal is heaven and not earth. Let's remember that. Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6, verses 19 to 20 of the book of Matthew, I quote him, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. So gang, if, if each one of us had kind of a uh, maybe a, a symbolical bank account, a treasure account here, 
And one is everything we're trying to build for a great life on earth. And one is everything we're trying to build for a great life in heaven. And every day we're making deposits in that. And you, you just think about that over the last 24 hours of your life. Which one you put most deposits in? Trying to make this life the best it can be or make heaven the best that it can be. And Jesus is saying the ultimate goal of God is, is heaven. That's where Jesus stands for us, not necessarily this earth. Now, as we go back to that first image that we've talked about so far, is that Jesus is standing in heaven with 144,000, the redeemed of all history. He's standing with them. And we're told several images about him that I think are interesting. And, and it, it, it kind of comes down to the fact, if you broke down the details of this image in the first five verses, I think they all come down to this. And I want you to hear this, that all of the descriptions of the 144,000 they deal with people who, while they were on the earth, they were diametrically opposed to the dragon and the beast. They stood against evil while they lived on the earth. And everything it talks about, about these 144,000, go back to that. That when they were on the earth, they did not succumb to the trickery and the deception of Satan and his cronies. If you remember the past few lessons when we talked about the dragon and the two beasts, it talks about them often, about how they would deceive us. They would trick us into following them, into, into buying their value system, and they deceived people. They even deceive those of us in the church. And then we arrive at chapter 14, we see the 144,000, and the thing about them was they were not deceived. They did not follow the trickery of our enemy. So what are some of these things? I just want to, I just want to show you a few. Toward the end, it just has this sentence. They, the 140,000, listen, they followed the lamb. They followed Jesus. They didn't follow the dragon. They didn't follow the anti-God government. They didn't follow the central figures of the Antichrist. They didn't follow any of the cronies of the devil. That's not what they did when they were on the earth. They followed the lamb. John's telling us that these first century readers... He's writing to them and he's saying, don't be fooled by Rome. Don't be fooled by a godless culture. Don't let them fool you into following them. And every Christian generation, yours and mine right now, from the point on of this writing should be careful that we are not deceived and fooled by anti-God empires and anti-God characters that we follow the righteousness of God. Do you follow the lamb? Do you follow the lamb? Because if you follow the lamb, even if evil beats you up, you will be with the lamb among the 144,000. You will be in heaven. He also describes that they did not defile themselves for women, for they kept themselves pure. You might have seen that when we read through that. This is one of those great texts, I think, that you can look at that shows the silliness of a literal view. So if you took that literally, okay, these people in heaven did not defile themselves with women for they kept themselves pure. Here's what that means. Everybody in heaven is a man. That's what, that's what that says. They did not defile themselves with women. So they're all men. They kept themselves pure. That wording of purity there, it, it actually means to be a virgin. So the only people who go to heaven are virgin men. Well, it's silly, isn't it? That's not what he's saying. His images throughout this book are metaphors. They are, they are symbolic scenes that mean something. And when you study the idea of sexual unfaithfulness, of impurity in the Bible throughout the Old Testament, it was often used as a metaphor for spiritual unfaithfulness, to be unfaithful to God. And so once we're finding out here again that these 144,000 were people while they were living on this earth, 
They followed the lamb. They were faithful to the lamb. They did not get fooled. They were not deceived into accepting and following a godless culture in which they live. And so, man, you can think about that for yourselves. And you just, you just ask yourself right now. I want to be among the 144,000. I want to be one of those that Jesus stands up and says, you're mine. How can I make sure that I'm one of those? It is to reject the anti-God culture of the day that asks us to live in ways that are contrary to the purity and the holiness of God. Do not follow an anti-God humanistic pagan culture in which you live today. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because if you can avoid it, then you receive this dose of encouragement. It, it also tells us that John said the 144,000 had the name of the Lamb and his Father on their forehead, okay? So the people of God in heaven have a marking on their forehead. Now, if you've been with us in this study, you know, you know what, that, what that is. Because only two or three verses earlier... At the end of the 13th chapter, we are told that the Antichrist, the second beast, the one out of the earth, that the Antichrist will convince people to have a mark on their forehead or their right hand. We're even told what the mark is, 666. And so, so we find out that the people of the enemy have a mark on their forehead, and we find that the people of God have a mark on their forehead. And you know, if you've been with us in the study, we're, we're not talking literal marks on the forehead. We're talking about the fact that these people were public and visible. It was clear who they belonged to. Everybody could see it on the forehead. So let me just get a, a bit challenging, a little preachy here for a second, and let me just ask you this question. Do the people in your circle, family, friends, work folks, do the people who know you, do they know without a shadow of a doubt who you follow? Because it's written on your forehead. And they just watch the way you live, and they know that you belong to the enemy or you belong to the lamb. That's, that's all that means. And so when you stand up for the lamb on this earth, when you reject the godlessness of the culture in which you live, you, you are opposed to that. There comes a day, this shot of great motivation that no matter what the enemy does to you on this earth, no matter what arrows he shoots at you, the lamb will stand for you in defense of one of his own lambs. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. When my children were young, I helped coach them in a community basketball league. So I, I had three children that God blessed me with, three boys, and they all played sports, they all played basketball. And so I was one of those um, volunteer coaches from the community that kind of helped them through the years and coached uh, the, the young boys. The, the league that we played in had a high school where they played all their games, and all the games were on Saturday morning. And so you, you had hundreds of people in the community at these games, and all our practices were throughout the week, and then came together on Saturday morning, Saturday evening. Those were our games. One, one year, I got a call. Uh, from the head of the league, the president of the league, and he said that they'd had a problem at the high school, some kind of a water thing, I think, a flooding or something. And uh, they had to cancel the games on Saturday. And they said, we're going to move them uh, to the next day. They think it'll be ready on Sunday. So we're going to move everything over onto Sunday. And I remember saying to him, he was a friend of mine, I said, hey, man, no problem. Nobody, nobody's fault. Nobody did that on purpose. That's totally okay. Now, I, I can't be there. I got a gig that I work on Sunday morning. I, I am a preacher. So obviously, I can't be there, but I'll call my assistant coach, no problem. He'll coach the team, and so uh, that's cool. Everything's all right. And so the league moved everything Sunday. They had all the games, and everything went fine, no problems. And all. But I heard about another team who didn't show up, and they forfeited. They, they didn't show up on Sunday. And I started asking about that, how all that worked out, and I found out that the coach of that team went to the church that I was the preacher at. 
and and he got a call too from the president of the league hey we, we you know we had the flooding thing and and my friend responded hey don't worry about it nobody did that on purpose you know no big deal um and and that's okay that's fine but we're we're not we're we won't be there because i don't think it's right for us to take away the one day that belongs to god and his church i, I don't feel right taking that away from them and so I'm not going to be there. My team's not going to be there. And and the president said, well, you know, I'm sorry to hear about that, but if you don't come, you, you got to forfeit. And he said, well, I'd rather us forfeit than to interject and take away the one day that belongs to God. So we're not going to do that. You can imagine how small I felt when I heard about that. I mean, I'm the preacher. I'm the one that's supposed to not be deceived. I'm the one that's supposed to stand for the force of good and, and do not be fooled into the force of evil. That, that, that was my job. And somebody who sat out in the seat every week and supposedly was learning from me was the one who chose to follow the lamb when everybody else was going a different direction. I've never forgot that story. See, as long as the dragon and his beast are moving around this earth, and before Jesus shows up and ends all of this craziness, we saints, me and you, we will have moments of decision like that. And the world is not always going to react favorably. I remember the president of the league told my friend, he said, I want to thank you for what you did. And he said, we're never going to do this again. We will never move something on Saturday over to Saturday. We're never going to do that again. And to my knowledge, to this day, they still have never done that. So the world will not always respond as favorably when we stand for that which is good. In fact, sometimes the world may only raise its temperature against us. But the lamb, <laughs> the lamb will always rise to his feet and welcome us. He will always defend us. And that's the dose of good news in chapter 14. And so I want to be one of the people in that crowd. Whether it's 144,000 or 144 gazillion, I want to be one of them. I want to be one of them. So be faithful, follow the lamb, and only follow the lamb. That's the first thing that he saw in chapter 14. Next lesson, we'll look at the second thing that he saw equally, equally as uh, dramatic. Hope you come back and see us then. God bless you.